moving swiftly on, I mean, we've had the autonomous car. Uh, while you were doing that, I was thinking, would we ever have autonomous planes? That would be a real jump of faith, wouldn't it? Yeah? A real leap of faith to get on a pilotless plane. I don't know if it... But what about autonomous ships? Because that's what we're going to listen to next, what the world of autonomous ships will be like. Uh, for those of you who are here, was it last year, a couple of years ago? Captain Phillips was here, do you remember? The guy who was kidnapped on his ship. And I immediately thought, well, that's a good enough reason to have autonomous ships. Imagine the pirates getting on the ship and there's no one on the ship there. It would be quite funny, actually. Um, to talk to us about autonomous shipping, we've got a great speaker next who knows a lot about this. I was looking at your history. Um, 2011, this next speaker was included in Lloyd's List 100 Most Influential People in the Shipping Industry. That's quite an accolade. Um, I like some of his job titles he's had. I think they're really cool. Concept Designer and Marine Life Cycle Solutions. Great, great titles. To talk to us about autonomous ships, please welcome from Rolls-Royce, Mr. Oscar Levander. A big round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are living in really exciting times, as you heard. And uh, this is also for the marine industry. Uh, we're going to see some big changes in the shipping. Uh, and a lot of these changes will be disruptive. We're going to change a lot how we ship things, what ships look like, how we operate them. And it's all driven basically by the digital development and the digital trends. I mean, you know, we are living in an era of digitalization, and it's all around us. It's changing uh, many parts of, uh, of the world we live in. It's affecting different industries. But you can say it started probably in the consumer market, and that's where most of the development has happened so far. And we like to talk about Internet of Things, uh, Industry 4.0, big data. All of these are part of digitalization. Uh, but they mean different things and a different part of it. And uh, this has changed the world. And we've seen basically new companies come in. We've seen old ones go out. Think, for example, of Airbnb. It's the biggest hotel room provider in the world. And they haven't invested in a single hotel bed. Spotify has really conquered a lot of the music business, put a lot of companies out of business as well. 10, 15 years ago, nobody knew what they were. They, they, they did not exist. So very rapidly, they have changed the game. Amazon.com, company many people know. I don't know if all of you are aware that they actually are going into shipping today. They have started a shipping company in China. So this is happening and it's coming. And when we talk about digitalization, in the marine world, I like to refer to it as ship intelligence. That's the term we like to use to describe the digital uh, development. Um, and I, I really like to say that we are at the dawn of a new era, the era of ship intelligence. So what is this uh, ship intelligence that I talk about? Well, basically it consists of many different things. And what we are really looking at providing to the industry is um, three main pillars. It's uh, around asset management, basically how we ensure the health of the ships out there. It's about how we optimize the ship and provide guidance for the crew in the form of decision support. And the third area is about remote and autonomous operation, which is one of the maybe, shall we say, more fundamental uh, changes that we will see in Japan. Below this, there are a lot of technologies that enable us to do it. Here we have all the big data, the cloud computing, Internet of Things, uh, and, and uh, shall we say, artificial intelligence and these things. Uh, those are things that we invest in today in order so that we can offer the value in the form of asset management or autonomous solution to the customers. And, uh, Yes, there are some customers that also come and ask us, can we buy some big data? Uh, we don't really know what to provide them then. We just maybe ask, what do you really mean? That's a hype word, and, uh, and that's not really in itself giving anything. But data is highly valuable 
when you analyze it and you turn it into value for that specific, for different re, uh, purposes. So this, all this ship intelligence, it will tra transform shipping. Uh, I think if you look at how we're going to operate ship in the future, they will not be individual ships out there at the sea treated as, as, as individuals. All shipping, all the ships will be uh, managed more as a total fleet and integrated into the end customer's process. So rather than optimizing a sea voyage, we need to optimize the production chain or logistic chain of the cargo inside the ship. That is what it needs to be done. And then think of, of a container vessel that basically might have 10,000 containers containing cargo from tens of thousands of different uh, logistic chains, the production chain. How do you optimize that? And then you have many of these container vessels. Now we come into the industry 4.0 thinking, and, and, and all of this needs to communicate automatically, so the internet of things. But that's the key. Instead of optimizing the sea voyage, we need to ensure that the end, end customer's production chain is optimum. And this will change how we operate the ships in the future. But also how we manage ships will change. I'd like to say that the key word here is total awareness. Whatever goes on, uh, happens on board the ship will be monitored on shore. And more and more of the control will move ashore. And this is all about ensuring basically the health of the ship, all the equipment, the system that they are performing, having the predictive maintenance and all this. And this will mean that ship and shore will no longer be so separate from each other. They will be more integrated. And we cannot distinguish so clearly what is a ship function and what is a shore function. They will, we will act more together. And also the business will change. If you're going to afford to invest in having really optimizing total fleets and building all this uh, uh, industry 4.0 thinking, managing ship, having shore centers for that, we need to see more bigger ship owners. The average size of a ship or the average fleet of a ship owner today, it's eight ships. And knowing that there are ship owners who have hundreds, even thousands of ships, you know there are a lot of ship owners who only have one or two ships. How can they afford to invest and stay competitive? Then either you have the option of consolidation in the market, which we see already, or alternative digital uh, alliances and new kind of business. So here we can think a little bit like Uber of the seas. Who is really going to be the one coordinating the cargo? Uh, and, and so on. Do you really, uh, what is the role of the ship owner? What is the role of the cargo forwarder and, and the cargo broker? Who is running the business? And we're going to see changes here. Looking at the aerospace industry, for example, it's mainly two companies who own all the airplanes in the world. So what is the role of the ship owner in the future? There are probably some ship owners in the group here who might think about that. It will it be more professional finance companies? Who will run the, the business? Is it going to be digital companies without uh, investments in ship themselves, like Uber and, and this type of, of businesses? And who is managing the ship? Will it be the equipment provider or someone else? This uh, remains to be seen, but there's definitely changes coming. And it's also going to change how we construct ships. Today, ships are not very reliable, and especially if you're going to go to more uh, unmanned ships and ships with less crew, we need more reliable solutions. Um, and ships today, you can say they are prototypes. That's what I like to say. Every ship out there is a prototype. Even when we build a series of ships, it's a prototype that's being copied over and over. It's not really a truly uh, designed, optimized, and validated solution, like you have in the automobile world or the, or the aerospace world. Shipping is quite unique in this sense, and that's actually one strength of shipping, that we are able to turn a, opt, a, a prototype into a functioning unit. But it's not really delivering the right solution, always. And I do think the, the world we're going to see in shipping will lead to more standardized systems in the ships, so that we can ensure the reliability of them. We need to ensure better uh, and, and, yeah, and this will be achieved through validation of the system and then trending it throughout the lifetime. But having the same system is not necessarily the same thing as the car, having the same ship. You can still 
optimize the ship uh, payload function. Some owner might want to have a longer ship some, uh, with more cargo capacity, some might have the shorter ship with less cargo for their specific route, but they can still have the same standardized system in them. And this will bring uh, a lot of benefit. Thinking about, for example, Airbus and these companies. In the past, every airliner went into Airbus and said, well, I want the cockpit to look a little bit like this, and I want this. And then they stopped, saying, no, Airbus, this is our standard, take it or leave it. Actually, it benefited the producer of the airplanes and operator of the airplanes. They have to be able to do it. And we need to do the same thing in shipping. Standardize the solution. Not having every ship owner come and say, I like this cooling pump or this uh, fueling system. That is not delivering the best product. And the ship owner should not really, that's not the core business of him, to think what is the right fuel system. So we need to look at how do we make a better solution. And uh, I think one of the, of, of the key factors is here. I mean, compared to other industries, like aerospace, no one today, or airline would, company, would go to the producer, Airbus or Boeing, and say, no, I, I don't like your fuel system. I would like to do it like this. Can you draw the fuel pipe through the through the fuselage another way. No, that's not the core business of airline company. So why, do, why should we in the marine world act in that way? So we're gonna have more standardized ships. But okay, Sh really ship intelligence at the end of the day, what it's going to deliver is a more efficient and safe operation. Around it, there will be a lot of other values, like more transparency, better connected people, better integrated into the larger logistic chains, and better performing equipment. And it's really going to revolutionize shipping. I like to compare this to the container. I mean, the container is, is probably, shall we say, one of the biggest changes we've seen in, in, in shipping. And it really changed uh, transport. I think it's basically done more for global trade than any political decisions done. And the container was invented at the end of the 50s by Malcolm McLean. And it took a few years, more than 10 years, for it to break through. But after that, it's really changed shipping. And I think the next change we're going to see is the ship intelligence revolution. And I think it's going to go a little bit faster, as we've seen in other domain of the digital world. Changes are fast. And probably one of the most visible parts of this ship intelligence revolution will be the introduction of the unmanned ships. That will be the ones, one of the things where we see as, from the public side. So why do we want to have uh, uh, unmanned ships? Well, you can say it's all around us in society. It's happening everywhere. everywhere. You just heard about what the car industry is doing. And it's coming. And this is a good thing, because basically this means that society today is more and more accepting of these solutions. So it's really not a question, is this coming to marine? It's only a question of when. And actually, it's coming sooner than most people think. It's going to be here in, in, in very shortly. And actually, some of these, these solutions are already out there in the form of unmanned uh, submarines and, and, and smaller boats. But what we really talk about is the big ships, the commercial shipping. So why do we want to go unmanned? Well, it's really clear. It's about providing more efficient and safe transportation. That's, that's the main thing here. It's about efficiency and safety. At the same time, we're also going to drive other uh, benefits, like providing better wor working conditions for the crew, uh, uh, lowering the emissions, and so things. But really, the main driver, what makes things happen, is the cost or, or the money in any kind of industry. And that's where you have, of course, a lot of benefit. Looking at the normal ship, the cost structure of a cargo vessel. You can say that there are three main cost items. It's the fuel, the investment, and the crew. In that order, usually, also. And the good thing with the unmanned ship is actually that we address all three of them. It's not only the crewing that goes down. We actually make the ship cheaper to buy, and we make the ship consume less fuel. So when we go to unmanned ships, we address the three biggest cost items. And this is one of the big important reasons why this is so attractive. So how do we do this? Well, if we don't have crew on board the ship, the main benefit is that, well, we don't need any space for the crew. So we can take off the deck house, we chop that off. 
uh, and that means that we have more space for cargo or we reduce the weight of the ship. But more importantly, just the deck out is, is all the systems. There are a lot of systems in the ship serving the crew or the people on board, like water production, ventilation, air conditioning, galleys, refrigerators, all these. And they cost money, take up space, and they have a certain weight. So when we can remove all this from the ship, we make the ship cheaper and simpler and more reliable. So there's a lot of benefit in there. Of course, we do need to invest in more automation, control, sensors, and probably also redundant machinery. So there is some extra investment. But at the end of the day, we calculate that we will save more money than we add, on to, add, add to the ship. So the ships will become cheaper when this is established. But also, more importantly, is that when we design these ships, without the human restrictions, we can really redefine the way ships look. And I think there we are only scratching the surface today, what is possible. Also, the energy we consume in the ship will go down. If we don't have the deck house, the ship is lighter. Uh, we have low, less wind resistance, and basically the electrical consumption of the ship goes down when we don't have all those systems serving the people consuming electricity. So we save around 10 to 50 percent of energy just by taking off things. Then when we really start thinking how we can operate the ship differently and integrate it, I think the saving potential is much, much bigger. So just by taking off things and uh, looking at, uh, at the crewing cost and the energy saving and so on, there's already more than 20% cost saving in the total transport cost. So this is not just uh, looking at, at, the, uh, at, at uh, a small part, but it, what it costs to transport something. And this is 20% uh, is, uh, is a big number. Uh, if you compare, if we do the same with energy saving, we would need to cut the fuel in more than half. And, uh, and it's almost the same as the capital investment for a ship. So it's a big number. Uh, and this is one of the main drivers for, for the introduction of the unmanned ship. In addition, the other thing that is driving this is the safety. We heard the same thing for the car. And in the marine industry, we have the same argument for unmanned. We're going to make shipping safer. Most marine accidents today are caused by human errors. Depending on the study, 76 to 96 percent, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, and most of these accidents uh, are related to the crew being fatigued. They are tired. They are not concentrated. So if, if we have a machine doing part of this navigation, stepping in there, we can definitely reduce this number. Probably not to zero, but much better than today. So we're going to have fewer accidents. The other thing, as we heard already, piracy. If we don't have people on board the ship, there are no hostages if the pirates come. And actually, uh, of course, people argue that, well, the ship is still in itself is valued something. The pirates might have easier uh, uh, option to take it. Well, going into a ship, taking it, if the pirates do that, then we can shut down the ship. They sit with the floating uh, ship out there in the ocean. It's not very easy to move. They need to take it under tow, and it's an easy job for the Navy to take it back. So actually, and especially, you don't have a hostage there to prevent the Navy to, to conquer the ship. So we're going to make shipping safer, both from fewer accidents, less risk of piracy, but also real thinking of what, where, who are the people injured in, in marine accidents? What is safe? The people injured in marine accidents are the seafarers. It's very seldom a ship runs over an innocent bystander. So if we remove the people from the dangerous place, we basically we don't put the people in harm's way. So what is really safer? 20 people out in a small vessel in the North Sea in a hurricane, or two people in a control room and land? You make the call. Of course, there is the new, new gen danger out there, cybersecurity. But this is not really new. It's already out there. And it's, it's as much related to a manned ship as an unmanned vessel. Cybersecurity needs to be addressed. And uh, the good thing is that when, you do, when we develop this solution, we develop it from the beginning. It goes into the architecture. Cybersecurity is not something you come 
and you put on top of a solution and say, okay, now it's good. This needs to be go into all how you operate the ship, how you design it, and, and, and the whole, uh, basically, uh, architecture and operation model. When I talk about these ships, I talk a little bit about remote control ships, I talk about autonomous ships and unmanned vessels. And they all have their place. Um, what we foresee is actually that we're going to have a mix between remote control and autonom autonomous operation. Um, when the ship is out at sea, it will be autonomous. It can drive itself. When we come closer to port, Uh, we foresee that the ship will be more in remote control. This does not mean that the captain is actually necessarily driving it, it's more like a human is supervision, or supervising the decision the ship makes. At least in the early phases we see this is, is easier, and also from a legal aspect point, it's easier to get it approved if we have a human still uh, overseeing the operation, because then there is a captain and, uh, who is responsible. So we're going to see this development, but then and when we do it in remote operation, we foresee that we build up basically a full situation awareness what's happening around the ship. We are going to have these operation centers that where a captain can sit, he has, has better visibility what happens around the ship, where we combine cameras, infrared cameras, uh, radar and LIDAR and all this to build up the reality around him. And he can then make the decision how to operate the ship. And he will have better uh, awareness what's happening around the ship than you would have from an existing ship, ship's bridge. Imagine you're on a container vessel, you have 200 meters of containers blocking your view in front of you. It might actually be fog. Today, you operate a ship basically on radar and GPS and chart plot. That's quite crude. In the future, these ships, you will combine the infrared camera with the normal camera, the LiDAR, you have the 3D view as you saw for the cars. All this will give a much better reality. And these are the things that are now being developed. But the key is that you need more than one sensor. One sensor is not good enough. So you need to fuse all the sensor information together and bring the holistic view. It's also a little bit how we operate the ship. This is a video showing some of how you would manage the vessel. So not drive it, but, but actually manage the, the, the daily operation and the health of the vessel. And there we would foresee that we would have this kind of control stations where you, super, where you can supervise many ships at the same time. We would use high tech technologies there about bringing up the relevant information for the operators. Uh, use uh, drones and other ones to create the holistic uh, information around the ship. Use different uh, kind of uh, trending systems, both uh, with uh, different type of sensors to create uh, uh, vision of what is the health of the machinery and all the systems, and, and being able to, to do prediction of what is the condition of the vessel. There is a longer version of this video on YouTube if you want to have a look. Uh, and there you can see a little bit how we see a potential future for how you manage ships in the future. But right now, that's future. We are quite concretely developing these solutions uh, for, for having, and, and we are working for di different type of ships. And the first ones that we're gonna uh, basically get on the water are more the smaller ships, like tugs, ferries, and then after that go to the bigger cargo vessels. But we also need to re recognize that unmanned shipping is not for all types of ships. There will be ships with crew out there in the future. For example, cruise ship. You need some people there in case of uh, evacuation. And frankly, what's the point of going a cruise, on a cruise if there's no one to provide you any service? Uh, so yes, we need there will be ships with, with people on board, and pro probably some sec or, uh, industry sectors like oil and gas are a little bit risk adverse, so they might want to opt to have some people left on, on, the, on the ship. But the ship will still utilize the same technology to make them more efficient and safe. And we are developing a lot of these technologies around there, and you can say that 
Yeah, we, we are working on the remote control system, what the control station should look like. We are working on the communication with some partners, uh, the cyber security we're bringing into the game. And these are quite okay, all of them. Communication might be a challenge to have enough bandwidth uh, in, in, in all positions, in all weather conditions, but uh, we think we are, uh, have that addressed. But the more challenging technical development is around the situational awareness. How we fuse these sensors together, the camera, the radar, the LiDAR, to create the, the holistic view, and then apply the navigation logic on top of this. Because we need the ship to be able to navigate automatically and avoid obstacles. And it's easy to apply certain maritime uh, rules on that. But the rules also talk about good seamanship. It's not clearly defined in the rules how you should act in all situations. They talk about you should apply good seamanship. And how do you teach a machine what good seamanship is? That's something we need to work on. And, uh, and it, it will not uh, happen overnight, so it will gradually evolve the, the autonomous capability of the vessel. To work. So that's one of the bigger challenges or areas that we are developing and working on. Uh, but maybe the most difficult one is actually the reliability, the health and safety of the vessel. How do we make a ship go weeks and weeks without human intervention? On a smaller ship that comes into port every day, it's easier. For a car, it's easier. But a ship that is in the middle of the ocean, you don't want it to stop just because something breaks. And every... Uh, Every system has parts in there that can break. So that's really the thing, how to solve that. We, and the solution to that is more standardized systems, more validated systems, better trending of the system so that we can predict before it goes wrong. But it will require mental shift in the industry to make this happen. And that's probably the most difficult technical challenge to make these ships a reality, is to work on this availability and reliability. But the challenges don't stop there. The other area is the regulations. And the uh, mar maritime world is known for being slow when it comes to, to making new regulations or changing them. And um, there are different uh, parts of this. IMO is the most important. And uh, that they are setting the international regulations. And we are lobbying in there, a lot of people. But it will take some time. Uh, the class societies are working on, on developing their rules, and that's a good thing. And that will help to convince the, the international maritime organization. But it, it will take some time. But it's not only regulations that is the aspect, it's also the legal. Who, who is responsible? Who is liable? And is it marine liability that applies, or is it more product liability? What is the liability of the system provider? These things are not yet resolved. So there are work going on. But actually, the good news is that there are a lot of flag states who make up the rules, who are very keen to do it. And that's actually why we foresee that the start of this development will be local. So the first unmanned ships that we're going to see will be locally operated within one flag state's water. Because then they can give us permission to operate already basically now. And we have a lot of these flag states, or a few of them, who are very keen to do it. The same thing you heard for the car industry. It's strategically important to be first. So there are some Nordic countries and some, some other uh, places where the flag state is very keen to see this happen. So that's why we're going to start with having smaller vessels like tugs, road ferries, operate first. And then we're going to move to coastal shipping and from there to the international bigger cargo vessels. But also, already today, we're going to apply the same technology developed to reduce the number of crew, but not to zero on a lot of ships out there. And that we can do very soon. So, some of the early applications we're going to see might be a ferry, crossing a fjord, automatically driving. It might be that there is still some crew on board, but as one ferry, a ferry owner told me, 
It might be that the captain is doing something more value-adding than driving the ship. He might be selling coffee or ice cream. Okay, joking aside, but yeah. It seems that uh, coffee making is still something that requires a lot of manual work <laughs> in today's world. So it might employ a lot of people. Yeah, but this is coming. This is one of the, some of the early movements. Other areas is the tug. Confined area, operating within one country's waters. High ship where manning cost is extremely high. I mean, crewing might be up to 70% of the total operating cost. So this is an area, again, where you could see a lot of benefit from going towards a remote-controlled or autonomous solution. So there are these clear applications that are the first movers. And from there, we will go over to the more international shipping. But what is very clear is that we are really entering a new exciting time. We are the dawn of a new era in shipping. And this is the ship intelligence era. And I like to end with a quote from a former US president, Abraham Lincoln. He said the best way to predict the future is to create the future. And that is what we are doing right now. We know these ships are coming because they are on the drawing board. Development teams are working on them. And uh, as we said, before the decade is out, we're going to have one of these uh, remote controlled autonomous ships on the water doing commercial work, not only testing, but real actual work. So it's coming soon, and it's going to change shipping as we know it. Thank you. Okay, okay great. Thank you so much, Oscar.